Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. The Signpost webinar series is brought to you in association with the National Rural Network, Food Drink Ireland and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. So with the focus now moving to sectoral carbon budgets and the role of agriculture in reducing national emissions, today we're going to take a closer look at methane emissions from Irish dairy systems, and in particular, the measurement and mitigation of the, the gas. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Lauren Shalou, who's a research scientist in Chagas Moor Park, Katie Starsmore, who's a research technician with the Vista Milk Project, and Dr. Ben Lahart, who is a postdoctoral researcher with Vista Milk, uh, also based in Moor Park. You're all very welcome to this morning's webinar. We're also joined by Pat Murphy down in Wexford. Pat is the head of the Environment Knowledge Transfer Programme in Chagas. And Pat, you're going to be helping us with the questions uh, afterwards. So, um, so Lawrence, if I could start with you, maybe you could introduce yourself to us and tell us a bit about the work that you're doing in uh, Moor Park. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, Lauren Shalou, um, based here in Moor Park, uh, I suppose a large part of our focus now is on uh, sustainability, as you know, up to now, probably very much was focused on, on economics and, and systems, but sustainability now is, is very much the core in, in what we do here, whether it's from a water quality to a greenhouse gas point of view. Very good. Thanks, Lawrence. And Ben, if I could ask you to, to, to tell us about how, how you're operating within the Vista Milk Project. Yeah, so thanks, Mark. Um, so currently we're doing experiments looking at, um, I suppose, animal traits, the influence genetics and the potential feed additives and how they're going to um, influence methane emissions, um, you know, and improve efficiencies within pasture-based systems at present. Great. Um, yeah. And what's your own background, Ben? Uh, so I'm from Kilkenny. Um, so I did, a, I did a degree in ag science in UCD and I graduated in 2016. And I did a PhD, which I finished up last year um, here in Chagas Moor Park. Very good. Very good. I like the way you started with the Kilkenny Kel part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie, uh, could you, you're very welcome, first of all, to the, the Science yeah. Post webinar. Could you tell us a bit about your own background? Yeah, so um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I am from New Zealand um, and I've been here since 2019. And since I've been here, I've um, be measuring methane from dairy cows um, lactating and during the dry period as well. Um, so my background is I grew up on a dairy farm in New Zealand and then went and did a Bachelor of Science and then after graduating I've ended up here so it fits my story. Brilliant, brilliant. And I understand you, you're starting a PhD as well yourself. Yeah, I've just started that, yeah, a couple months ago. Best of luck with that. Thank you. So, um, so Lawrence, you're going to give us a few slides for some context uh, to, to the the, the situation and then uh, then Ben and, and Katie, Katie are going to follow. So uh, we'll hand over to you, Lawrence. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, and I suppose, you know, um, just to acknowledge that Katie and Ben are here, but Jonathan uh, Hearn, who is also part of this 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 research work, um, is, is, is in the background and um, we'll, we'll hear from him some other day. So I suppose just what I want to do here is just give a little bit of background to the to the story, talk a little bit about emissions and then focus a little bit to why we are uh, more interested in methane now than we were maybe a little bit in, 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 in the past. To start off, uh, what I want to do is just talk about um, ruminant agriculture and talk about what we're trying to, to do, what we're trying to achieve. And I suppose it's important that we contextualize, you know, what, what, what ruminant agriculture is trying to do. So I suppose if we look at total protein efficiency um, in, in, in broad terms, uh, it's protein produced that, you know, humans can eat versus protein that's consumed by the animal. And that's probably not very useful because to a large degree, most of what the animal eats, we can't consume as humans. So, you know, when we look at um, efficiency of our system, a much more useful thing to look at is, is net efficiency or net protein efficiency. So what that is really is human edible uh, proteins produced by the system versus human edible proteins consumed by the animal. And really what we're trying to do with our system is to, uh, you know, I suppose to a large degree, maximize the human edible protein that we produce while minimizing the human edible protein that our animals consume. Because, you know, as we go forward, you know, the question will always be asked, does it make sense that animals are eating 
uh, foods that humans can eat. And that's that's something that I think over time will become a bigger question. So I suppose uh, this work that I'm just going to, the slide I'm going to show you now is, is based on work that was done uh, in, in France and it was adopted by uh, um, work that was done by Wilkinson and Ertl in 2011 and 2015. And actually we're following that up with work ourselves in the, in the same space here. So basically, when we look at total protein efficiency, we can see that both TMR and TMR is total mixed ration. It's where animals are housed uh, pretty much all, all year round, and the milk is produced indoors. Uh, and virtually, you know, 85% of the milk in the world is produced in that format. Um, versus grass-based, where animals are, you know, out grazing, which is similar to our system. So I suppose from a total protein efficiency point of view, they're both quite similar, uh, you know, at you know, 25, 26% in terms of overall efficiency. But when we look at net protein efficiency, so human edible in versus human edible out, uh, where animals are, you know, where most of the milk is produced in the world, animals, you know, that ratio is, is at one to one. So we get one kilo of human edible out for one kilo of human edible in. And, and from a, from a grass-based system, that's roughly about 2.6, 2.7 to one. So much higher ratio of human edible out versus what's going in. And again, as I said, this is based on French work. When we do the same, exercise with um, using Irish data and modeled Irish scenarios, we come up with a ratio of four to one. So I suppose as we go forward, as we look at our systems going forward, and we look at the overall sustainability of our systems, you know, the higher that ratio is, the better. Uh, and, you know, and I suppose a grass-based system is positive in that, in that sense. I suppose the next step in this analysis and it's work we're working on in the moment is looking at the opportunity cost of the land you know, if that land that is used to produce feed for the animal that we can't eat was used to produce a different product that humans could eat, what would, how would that affect the numbers? And, and that's called land use ratio, and that's something we're working on. But again, it's quite positive from an Irish context in, in that calculation. So just then looking at how, you know, sustainability and look at our grass-based system versus animals that are kept indoors, uh, how do we compare? And this is, again, uh, again, don't worry about the detail here, but just to say that a grass-based system uh, has a lower footprint than a confinement-based system. And this is based on work we did a couple of years ago where we modeled indoor and outdoor systems. And in that, essentially, our grass-based system had a total footprint that was about 15% lower than the confinement system. Yes, the makeup of that was different. There was different proportions of enteric fermentation. Uh, you know, the, the bought-in feed was a much higher proportion of the confinement system or the TMR system uh, versus the grass-based system. So that's, that's the first point. When we look at the overall sustainability and we look at the relationship between, for example, greenhouse gases to uh, profit, uh, basically what we can show is that our farmers that are more profitable generally have a lower carbon footprint. So this is based on work we did uh, three or four years ago where we looked at the National Farm Survey, uh, we modeled it, and we looked at the relationship between profit and greenhouse gases. So generally, our farmers that are more efficient have a lower carbon footprint and are more profitable. Then I suppose if we look then further and say, how do we compare against other countries in terms of our carbon footprint? And again, this is uh, based on work that we did maybe three or four years ago, where we compared uh, a top performing, kind of almost a research setting for Ireland versus the UK versus the US. And in that scenario, what we showed was that um, basically our, the footprint in Ireland was about 9% lower than the UK and about 12% lower than the US. So top performing uh, farms in Ireland, the UK and the US, you can see that the Irish footprint was lower than um, the, um, the others there that we're comparing against. Again, that was work we published a couple of years ago. This slide has gone up very frequently. I, some of the audience would have seen this many times. And what it basically is a piece of work that was done in 2010. I completely accept that it's dated, but it's a good reference point because it's, it's a piece of analysis that was done uh, using the same approach, uh, same models and same methodology. So what, what it was was uh, the GRC or the Joint Research Group did a analysis of different countries in Europe where they compared the carbon footprint of milk from different countries. And basically what they showed was uh, Ireland was the lowest or joint lowest uh, across, the, across the EU at that point. Now, the fact that this is you know, 10, 11 years old, that the data is probably 15 years old, uh, obviously you know, means that the, that the value of this going forward is reduced, but it's a good reference point to where we were 
uh, a number of years ago. Probably the most recent analysis that was done um, on a country comparison was done a few months ago. And there's, uh, it was done by the uh, Dairy NZ and Ag Research in New Zealand. Um, and basically what it did was it took published studies um, and it took data from those published studies and it, it related those to each country. There's many problems with this study and we've gone through this in, 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 in the past, but just to compare, I suppose, just to talk about it for a second and, 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 and just see where the numbers lie. In this study, um, you can see here that the, uh, Ireland came out at 1.18. Uh, based on their numbers. And for example, the likes of New Zealand had a carbon footprint of 0.74 and there's other countries in between. I suppose when uh, we looked at the report, we found many errors. Uh, we went back to the authors on the errors uh, and essentially based on um, the authors accepting these errors, they actually recalculated the report and regenerated the report with a new set of numbers for Ireland, right? So that's the, the first thing. But I suppose that actually probably doesn't explain maybe some of the bigger issues with the report in terms of um, some countries are in there representing um, uh, individual countries. An example would be Portugal. Portugal is in there at 0.86 and the data for Portugal is based on the Azores, which probably is a long way from, you know, um, from, from Portugal and is a small group of farms and so on. So just to say that point that, that the report uh, when calculated correctly had us down at 107. I suppose there's a lot of work going on in, in this research from a greenhouse gas point of view over the last number of years, and particularly done in, in Johnstone Castle in relation to nitrous oxide and emissions from urine, from dung, and from fertilizer. And we put all those, uh, I suppose, into our carbon footprint models. And when we do that, our carbon footprint model comes out at, with a carbon footprint of less than one kilo of CO2 equivalent per kilo of fat input and corrected milk. So a substantial reduction without any change in activity data just changing the emission factors. And these are emission factors that are now included in the national inventory. So they're, they're, broad, they're very accepted. Uh, they're from published work. Uh, we can see that our carbon footprint has gone down under one kilo of CO2 per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk. So that brings us down to roughly around uh, one point, um, just roughly one. So that's what our carbon footprint looks like. And I just said earlier, the New Zealand one in the report was 0.74. If we include direct land use change, so you know, land uh, that was converted from forestry into pasture uh, from dairy, and that brings the New Zealand figure up to 0.88. So really what we're trying to say here is that there, we're very close to countries like New Zealand in terms of carbon footprint based on published work. Most of the other studies in this report, I would to a certain degree discount because they're not, it's not a similar methodology or it's not a similar calculation process. So I suppose just to say that we're quite similar to New Zealand in terms of our over, overall footprint. The question is, where do we go from here? And I suppose this is just to paint a picture of where, where we're going to go. Um, I suppose we're roughly at one kilo CO2 equivalent now. The inclusion of protected urea, and this has been covered many times on, on, in this forum, uh, would bring us down to roughly 0.92 in terms of carbon footprint. Um, the inclusion of protected urea, as well as lower crude protein concentrate, and the lower crude protein concentrate has a direct impact on the land use change. So less soya, less land use change, less feed coming in from South America uh, has a, you know, obviously has a strong impact on the carbon footprint. So bring us back down to roughly 0.85. Um, better performance, higher performance uh, that we expect to get uh, over time would bring us to roughly 0.8. And the inclusion of carbon sequestration in our numbers would bring us to a figure of 0.7. And that 0.7 just happens to be the signpost target. So the signpost target for the signpost program is to generate milk with a carbon footprint of 0.7. And I've just gone through the pathway to get there in terms of protected urea, lower crude protein concentrate, higher animal performance, the inclusion of sequestration. And as I suppose as more technologies come on, that target might even get lower. So a large part of what I just discussed is background. What I want to talk about now is where we go forward in terms of strategies, in terms of what we're trying to achieve with mitigation, in particular in relation to methane. So I suppose just one point on the mitigation strategies, um, and, and, and I think it's important to distinguish. Um, there's two, two approaches. One is to focus on mitigation strategies that reduce the carbon footprint. So these are largely efficiency measures. So they'll reduce the carbon footprint, but they may or may not 
be associated with a change in absolute emissions. So the example here is genetics. So genetics is associated with a reduction in carbon footprint. So um, a kilo of milk drops from, we'll say, one to 0.9 based on genetics. Um, but uh, because milk yield per cow goes up, goes up uh, there may not be a change in the absolute emissions. So that's one approach. The second approach is the absolute emissions. So we have some technology that generally reduces total emissions, and it may or may not have an impact on the footprint. If it reduces performance, it will have a deleterious effect on the footprint. If it doesn't, um, it might. So I suppose to distinguish between the two, the efficiency type measures are generally ones that will increase profitability at farm level as well, whereas the absolute ones um, may not um, reduce, may not increase profitability. So, you know, the efficiency ones, farmers are going to be incentivized based on efficiency to adopt. The absolute ones, we may need some other measures to encourage farmers to adopt. And I suppose really what we want to focus on is the ones that reduce both the footprint and the absolute emissions uh, and can increase efficiency. If we, if we focus on those, they essentially will increase profitability and will increase farmers' willingness to adopt. So that's mitigation. Just then to talk a little bit, and I'm, I'm nearly finished up here, about methane and in particular, um, biogenic methane, and maybe discuss for a second about you know, new metrics and how they might affect the overall numbers. So this slide is quite busy, but we'll, you know, I just want to get through the broad premise from the slide. And just to, what is biogenic methane? And biogenic methane is, is, is essentially emitted from biological processes, including livestock. So what, what is it? So plants through photosynthesis absorb uh, carbon dioxide, so during that process, they're absorbing carbon dioxide. The ruminants eat the plants. They break down the indigestible cellulose in their rumens. And the carbon that's locked up, the CO2 that went into the plant, that's now in the cellulose, is released during that process in the form of methane. And after about 12 years, um, the methane is converted back to carbon dioxide and the cycle starts again. So that's the process. So CO2, true photosynthesis going into the plant, the plant consumed by the animal, and the methane released through um, through the through that carbon, and after 12 years, it's 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 um, broken down, and that CO2 is available to go back into the plant again through photosynthesis. Whereas in terms of why is that different to fossil fuels? Well, I suppose we're talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of years from a fossil fuel that carbon being locked up. The cycle is probably similar or the same, but the time frame is hugely different. So it's stored for a very long time. So I suppose, you know, there's a lot of debate about, you know, new metrics for methane and what impact they might have. Um, so I suppose if we just stand back from it and look at a situation where methane is constant, so no change in methane from the system. So what you have there is the same amount of methane being produced as being oxidized. Uh, so essentially methane not changing. There is little additional, and the, the important thing here is additional warming effect. So if methane isn't changing, the additional warming effect uh, is not changing. So that's, that's, that's important in terms of understanding, you know, I suppose the differences between the metrics. So just to demonstrate that, what we've done is we've showed uh, the Irish methane production under GWP 100, which is the standard uh, approach that we use in most of our work versus GWP star. And I suppose GWP star reflects that methane has a half-life of 12 years and has a higher multiplier. So over that shorter period, the effect, warming effect is much higher um, using the GWP star. But that almost doesn't matter if there's no change in the methane. If methane is going up, the effect is much bigger. If methane is going down, the effect is much bigger. But again, if there's no change, um, you know, it's almost irrelevant what, what the numbers are. And uh, GWP 100 is what we're used to. That gives a multiplier to methane of about 28 times CO2. So essentially the warming effect is, or the carbon effect is 28 times um, the value of CO2, whereas nitrous oxide is 265 times. So just to give a set of numbers, and again, the detail here, not important at all, just to, to demonstrate, these are our national inventory uh, methane numbers um, from the last 20 years. And essentially what we have here is, you know, a significant variation across years, um, you know, 547,000 tons of methane in 1998 versus 518 or 519,000 tons in 2018. So significant variation across years, probably at its lowest point here in 2011, 
increasing since then with the increase in dairy cow numbers. And that is a direct effect on the CO2 equivalent, uh, which is a, just a direct multiplier of the methane. When we look at the same exercise, and again, this is the same slide, just looking at 20, 2018 to 2010, same slide. When we look at it using GWP star, and remember the calculation for GWP star refers back to 20 years ago. So it's a very simple calculation. It's you know where we are today from a methane point of view multiplied by 100 minus where we were 20 years ago multiplied by 94. So there is a small residual effect in the calculation. What this calculation shows is in the last decade, um, from a methane perspective, there was a cooling effect. So that's, that's important. From a, from a methane perspective, there was a cooling effect in the last decade. And since 2017, we've just started to uh, go into positive terms. And that really means is that, you know, it's only in, in 2017, 2018, that the methane numbers has started to uh, increase beyond where they were uh, 20 years previous in the overall calculations. So just look forward then and look, you know, what does that mean for the overall numbers and, and how does that, you know, multiply up? So what I've just shown here is a situation where we have uh, 2010 to 2030 in terms of, you know, our standard GWP 100, which we normally use to calculate the emissions we can see here that with a 1% increase from 2018, we're having a slight increase over time going from maybe 13 and a half million tons up to maybe 14 million tons in terms of our CO2 equivalent over that period of time. With GWP star, with a 1% increase, and this is what I talked about earlier in terms of we're just starting going into the positive territory now, with a 1% increase in uh, emissions in methane per year, what essentially we're showing here is that actually there is very little difference between GWP and GWP star by 2030. So, you know, with a 1% increase in methane, um, the increases goes close, quite close up to the GWP 100 from a methane perspective. If we have a static situ situation from methane, what we're looking at here is, um, sorry, we're looking at it, you know, the number being somewhere less than 10 million tons. If we had a 1% decline, we're looking at somewhere around 1 million or 5 million tons. And if we had a 2% decline in methane over that period per year annually, we're looking at somewhere around um, almost zero or no effect. So essentially what this is showing us here is that um, with uh, GWP star, the effect of change in methane is grossly magnified. Uh, and I suppose, there's a lot of debate out there now around, you know, should we have a separate target for methane or not? And I suppose what this shows here is, you know, having a separate target for methane, the multiplier, the effect using GWP star or using the, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, maybe a metric that better reflects the lifetime of methane and its impact. Basically, what this shows here is the magnifying effect can be much bigger, um, you know, and, and the power of methane in our inventories or in our calculations becomes much bigger. You know, what does all this mean? And I suppose what we just put in here is where we are in terms of livestock numbers. This is the livestock numbers in December from the CSO over the last, between 2005 and 2020. And clearly what this shows is since 2017, we're starting to see a slight decrease in overall livestock numbers in, in, in from a meet and per, from an overall livestock perspective. So I suppose combine that with the previous slide uh, in terms of where, you know, an increase in methane, the impact that might have, and maybe potentially uh, where we're going or where what has started to happen over the last three or four years from this is CSO, this is actual livestock numbers in December. Basically, we're starting to see a, a you know a slight uh, tail off in, in the overall numbers. So two, two of those together are saying that you know the effect on methane obviously will follow. So before I hand over to Katie, uh, I suppose just to summarize, you know, and this probably for me justifies why there's a need and a requirement for much more focus on um, methane as we go forward. The importance of methane mitigation increases under GWP star metrics. So, you know, the effect of an increase or decrease in methane is much, much more magnified. Um, so I suppose whatever, you know, research, whether it's on uh, where we are today, you know, what the effect of grass quality is, what the effect of genetics is, what the, the effect of, for example, age uh, at finishes in terms of the um, methane effect or even additives, what their, their effect becomes much, much more important in a scenario 
where we use a different metric to the one that we're currently using. So Mark, that's it. I'll, I'll hand it over there to you, Katie, now, um, and I'll stop sharing here. So at the moment, we have four grain feed machines, and I'll talk more about what they are, but that's what we're using to measure methane at the moment. So currently, with the trial work that we're doing, we have um, over 150, I think there's around 165 cows that are being measured at the moment. So there's three main trials that will be going on this year. Uh, the first one will be a full lactation trial, which Ben will be carrying out on the Kilworth farm. Um, and he'll be looking at um, the methane profiles throughout a full lactation and then also looking at um, breed um, impacts as well and genetic impacts, looking at the, the national average and elite herds um, as well as the Jersey herd. Then um, I've just carried out a spring grazing management trial. So looking at the effect that uh, silage supplementation in the early spring and that, the effect that that has on methane. And later on in the year, we'll be looking at the effect that white clover within the sward has on uh, methane emissions. So previously, uh, we've done four winter trials. Uh, so that's been mostly looking at feed additive work. And we've done one mid to late lactation grazing study. So how and why are we measuring methane? So the, I guess the first point that's important to note is that eight, sorry, 95% of methane that's emitted is actually through um, burping or eruptation um, and also through exhalation. So the way we measure methane, it's really important that we capture that release. So we measure methane through um, the mouth um, and only 5% is through flatulence. So that's, um, that's why we're measuring through the mouth. So the way we, we measure methane is through this machine called a green feed. Um, and so this is a technology that's come from America. And the way this works is, as you can see in the photo there, a cow puts her head into the machine. Um, and each cow has an electronic uh, identification tag. And so the machine is able to read that tag. And so we know exactly what cow goes in when and how often. So when she puts her head into the machine, the air that she's breathing out while she's in um, is sucked up. It's sucked up through an air filter, then goes up this chimney bit you can see there. And just before the air is expelled back to the atmosphere, uh, an air sample is taken. So this air sample is then taken back down to the sensors, which is underneath the feed bin. So what we can see on the left-hand side there is uh, what the cows see when they walk into the machine. So as the cows walk in, you can see the silver dish at the bottom there. That's um, the feed bin where uh, the air is sucked in through. So I, I don't know if you can see, but there's little holes in the feed bin there where, where the air is sucked in through. And so I guess the incentive for the cows to visit this machine throughout the day while they're grazing is that they, that they get little um, bits of concentrate. So we've programmed it so that the, the machine will drop feed every 20 to 25 seconds um, over a two minute period. And each of these drops is only 30 grams. So she's getting um, around 300 grams every time she visits the machine. So we're trying to limit the amount of concentrate eaten, but also trying to maximize, um, maximize the time in the machine. So to be able to get accurate results, we need to get at least a two minute um, period in the machine. The photo on the right there shows the machine um, parked up next to the grazing plot. And so the trailer is uh, moved around the grazing rotation to follow the cows. So the cows have 24 seven access to this, um, except during milking time. So on average, the cows visit the machine around two times a day. And that seems to be giving us good amounts of data to be able to accurately estimate their methane emissions. So now we just look at the visit pattern. So this is what we classify as a visit, is a visit that's over two minutes long. Um, and so each visit is one individual cow visiting the machine. And so what we see here is that the, the visits vary throughout each hour of the day. And what we found interesting is when we looked at this, that the almost the peak is at the early morning of, of the day. So at one o'clock in the morning, you see most cows visiting the machine. Um, which we thought was interesting. It's just a bit of animal behavior, I guess. Um, and then there's a drop off at two, three and four o'clock in the morning. And the reason we think why that's done that is because the machine is set up that the cows can only visit once every four hours. So if the cow's visiting at one o'clock, she won't be able to get any more concentrate until five. She can still visit the machine, but she might not stay long enough because there'll be no concentrate dropping for her. So that's just a bit of interesting animal behavior stuff that we're seeing. Then when we look at the visit pattern, we also see, so we have um, each of those bars. So the blue is parity one, the red is parity two, and the green there is parity three. So parity one is first lactation, parity two is second lactation, and parity three is third lactation onwards. So we thought um, just from 
like experience in the in the field that the older cows might be more dominant in visiting the machines more often but what we can see is that it's an even spread between all ages of the cows so that's looking very promising that um that there's no dominance or bias effect coming into play for that and you can see that the visits drop through um, at milking time which is what we expect when they don't have access to the machine so just quickly look at the methane that we're getting. So this um, is the diurnal pattern. So the diurnal pattern is showing that the, the methane drops during milking time, which could be as a result of the lack of measurements. Um, and then it increases shortly after milking, which could be a result of um, the cows going into fresh grass so they'll eat more, which will, reduce, which will result in more methane being produced. So when we compare it to the graph on the right, which is an indoor beef system here in Ireland, we see that after feeding time the methane increases as well. So what is quite clear is that the methane is expected to increase um, after a feeding intake increases. So the data that from the grazing um, diurnal pattern there was from the end of lactation last year. So now we'll just look into the research um, areas and I'll pass you on to that in a second but I'll just quickly talk to you about the sward factors. So and um, what's it's important to note is that when you increase grass quality, you would decrease the methane um, output per kilogram of dry matter eaten. But in saying that, when you have a higher grass quality, cows generally um, decide to eat more, um, which results in an increase in absolute um, in methane emitted throughout that day. So, and there also could be factors um, that we need to look into uh, with white clover and multi-species as well. So we'll be looking into the white clover at the end of this year, but um, previous research has, so has shown that it can decrease, well, the inclusion of clover could decrease the amount of methane emitted per kilogram of milk produced. So that could help with the, the efficiency measures, um, as Lawrence was talking about before. So I'll pass you on to Ben now, and he's going to talk about the animal factors um, and the feed additive work we've been doing. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to pick up from where Katie left on off there and just talk about the uh, other two areas we're looking at presently with, in relation to um, methane with the green feeds. So the first of these areas is animal factors slash genetics, and the second is the potential of feed additives. So you can see there in the picture on the right-hand side, that was the herd of cows we had using the green feed last year. And we had, um, we had a nice spread of animals. We had 46 animals using the machine, um, and we had methane recorded daily. So in addition to methane, we also had records of milk cell, daily milk production and uh, we also had weekly live weights. So we're able to look at how these relate to meat and output and efficiency. And we also had um, different lactation numbers. So we we're able to look into this as well. Um, so in terms of lactation number within the herd, so what we observed was that party three plus cows were producing significantly less methane per kilo of milk solids output. So they were more efficient in producing milk. This is because they're more productive and are diluting the amount of methane they're, they're basically producing. Um, the younger, younger party cows basically have to put more energy towards maintenance requirements and growth. So it's basically um, reducing their efficiency. So what this means is as farmers improve their fertility, increase longevity, they're going to increase efficiency of milk production within their herd. Another thing we noted was that lighter animals, so smaller animals within the herd, were producing less methane per um, kilo of milk size output. This is because they, you know, they have lower maintenance requirements and they're more efficient because they're able to put more of their um, intake towards milk output. Um, and finally, and I suppose it's a small bit obvious, but animals who are more, produce more milk solids are producing less methane per kilo of milk solids. This is because they're diluting their methane emissions um, because they're more productive. So what this means in combination is that we select for these traits, we're going to select for improved efficiency. But when we think again about the economic breeding index, which we currently have in Ireland for selecting the next generation of dairy replacements, we're already selecting for these traits. We're selecting for increased milk solids output we're selecting for better fertility, and we're selecting for lower live weight through the maintenance of index. So we're also we're already selecting for increased efficiency within our herds through DVI. Um, we're selecting for lower methane um, per kilo of milk solids output. So we recently did um, research that we got published in the Journal of Dairy Science, and it's in press at the minute, looking at the total greenhouse gas emissions profile of animals of divergent economic breeding index. So we use the next generation herd for this, um, which is basically two. Um, two groups of animals managed within the same herd and a hundred euro difference in terms of their EBI. So we use the life cycle assessment analysis, which basically measured their total greenhouse gas emissions profile. So this is methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide emissions um, to, to 
you know, to quantify what was the total environmental effect of selection on the EBI. So there was no absolute difference in greenhouse gas emissions between high and the average EBI cows, but there was a difference in the breakdown of the emissions between the cows. So the high EBI cows had greater emissions from the lactating herd, um, greater methane emissions from the lactating herd, I should say, this because they're older, they're eating more grass and they're producing more methane as a result of this. But this was offset by lower emissions associated with rear and less replacements. So this basically balances the total greenhouse gas emissions between the two groups on an area basis. But when we consider that the elite herd are producing 10% more milk output because they're, again, they're older and they're more productive, this is basically diluting their greenhouse gas emissions and it's leading to 10% lower greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of milk output. So for each 10 euro increase in EBI in this study, we observed 1% less greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk. So 10 euro um, is the average rate of genetic gain in EBI per year. So as farmers continue to select on the EBI um, and improve the EBI annually, we're going to see a reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions intensity by 1% per year. So over a 10-year period, we, we want to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions intensity by 10%. You know, it's very this is very positive, and you know it's going to mean that the EBI is continuing to select and improve um, you know, the, the carbon footprint of milk that's been exported from Ireland. But it won't have uh, any effect on total greenhouse gas emissions on an area basis. So to, to, to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by selection on DBI, we're going to have select for methane. Um, so there's, DBI has been fairly static over the last few years. There hasn't been much change to it. Um, so to include a new trait in the breeding index, such as methane, you need to have meet three criteria. So um, the trait needs to be socially or economically important. I would think methane is socially important. Um, the trait also needs to be there needs to be a variation there for the trait. So you can see there on the graph on the right hand side, this is data we had from the herd last year. So you can see there this relation between methane and milk solids output. So you can see for any given level of milk solids output, there's nice variation there for methane in that there's, you know, there's high and low methane emitting animals. So there is scope to um, select um, these low methane emitting animals. But I suppose the final thing, and this is going to probably be the, the biggest obstacle, is the uh, routine availability of data. So you need lots and lots of records of um, animals to generate breeding values. Um, so we don't have these at present for methane. Um, you know, we have the green feeds here in Moor Park, they're measuring methane on 150 cows, but you're gonna need much, much more data to generate breeding values. So there's research ongoing in Vista Milk, um, looking at the potential of milk carding, which will be conducted in the next few years by um, Sinead and Parland, and this will be interesting research to follow um, in this regard. Um, and I suppose, finally, once you've decided that you're going to include methane, what you include the trait as, the trait definition. Are you going to select for lower methane in total, lower methane per unit of um, milk output, or lower methane per unit of feed intake? Um, I suppose potentially lower methane per unit of feed intake would be, would be um, a suitable fit for grazing system, as we don't want to reduce feed intake in grazing systems. You know, feed intake is a very important trait for um, lactate and dairy cows to, you know, to, to improve their energy status. And... Um, improve the fertility. So if you get a whole feed intake constant and reduce methane for that given level of feed intake, that could potentially be a, a good thing to select on. So that's genetics. Um, and then moving on then to um, feed additives. So feed additives are another thing that can be potentially um, used to reduce methane emissions. So there's been a large number of studies conducted indoors over the last number of years, um, you know, at varying degrees of success. And there's been some big headlines you can see there up to 80% reduction um, in methane emissions, no effect on milk yield supplementation on seaweed. Um, so these are just some of the different additives. They all work in slightly different ways, um, you know, but they all have the same end result if they can, if they're successful in that they can meet, mitigate methane. So you can see there that the range in, in efficacy between 10 and 47% on average between those studies. Um, but these studies have been conducted indoors. So within indoor settings, animals um, you know, are generally offered total mixed ration diets. And this allows, um, allows basically farmers to supplement cows with feed additives with, within the diet continuously mixed through it. So each time an animal um, consumes feed over the day, it's, it's getting um, the additive going, continuously going into this rumen, which is, you know, it's, 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 it's having you know, a very positive effect on the ability of the additive to reduce methane. In grazing systems, we're a bit more limited in that we can only supplement 
you know, once or twice daily at evening and morning milking. So it kind of limits us in our ability to have, you know, a, a, you know, a large effect on um, the success of these additives. So we conducted two um, experiments last year, looking at the potential of two different um, additives and their effect on methane emissions and milk production in grazing dairy cows. So we did two independent studies. Um, in one study, we looked at a blend of phytochemicals and the second study, we looked at a blend of seaweeds. So within the phytochemical study, the animals were offered one gram of phytochemical per kilo of concentrate, and they were compared to a control group, which received a standard kilo of concentrate without the inclusion of the phytochemicals. And within the seaweed study, the animals received um, 70 grams of seaweed per kilo of concentrate. So the seaweed was a mix of red, um, green and brown seaweeds. Um, and these again were compared to a control group re receiving a kilo of concentrate. Um, so in, within each of the two independent studies, the Concentrate was fed over um, two split feeds at evening and morning milking, um, and the animals consumed grass for the rest of the day. Um, so the animals within each study were randomly assigned to the treatment control group, and methane emissions and milk production were recorded daily. So the results were as follows. So there was no significant effect detected um, for the phytochemicals on methane emissions. There was a tendency towards um, increased milk solids output, um, but there's no uh, absolute reduction in methane per kilo of milk solids, which isn't shown here. In terms of the seaweed then, there was no significant effect detected for um, methane emissions, or there wasn't no significant effect detected for um, milk solids output. Um, I suppose it's in early days yet, this research, so we're going to look into more additives. Um, I'm going to test more additives this year um, and you know, see what we find. Um, no, but it could potentially be required that the additives could have to be tailor tailored to grazing systems. Um, you know, and we could potentially have to look into slow release um, formulations, or but we'll, we'll um, look into that in the future if necessary. So the conclusions are: um, swore characteristics and methane need more research. Um, the economic breeding index is breeding more efficient animals, but it's not selecting for reduced emissions on an absolute area basis. So direct selection for methane may be required in this regard. And virtually all additive research globally is in is within indoor systems. So we need to focus on additives suitable for grazing systems. Um, so that's it. And um, if you have questions, fire away. And if anyone wants to find out any more information, you can contact uh, me directly at the email address provided there. That's great, Ben. Thank you very much, uh, Katie and Lawrence. Uh, thank you too for your presentations. So I can invite everybody back and uh, Ben, maybe you could stop sharing your screen for yep. us as well. Um, so we've lots of questions coming through. So given the time that we're, 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 uh, we're going to more or less skip straight to, to the questions coming through from our, our, our audience. But just a, a quick one for you, Lawrence, um, you were giving us the, the overall sort of bigger picture in terms of, of methane. Um, you know, there was a there was a, a some of Chagas senior management met with uh, the agriculture committee this week in the Oireachtas, and uh, they they said that the current scientific understanding indicates that reducing Irish, Irish agricultural greenhouse gas emissions through technical means is challenging, particularly so for biogenic methane reduced by pasture based ruminants. Um, in that context, you know. What's your view in terms of the, the reducing absolute emissions? And we, we've heard some of the questions coming through. Should we not be looking at a per hectare uh, type of, of me metric rather than a, on a per animal or, or per uh, litre uh, emissions? Maybe you could get your views on that. Yeah, and I suppose, Mark, that's probably one of the reasons that I kind of, uh, you know, distinguish between a footprint based approach versus an absolute approach. So, you know, ultimately we have, technologies and Ben went through one of them on and from a genetic point of view that is having a very strong effect on the footprint but you know it is it is uh, producing more milk so that means that the overall numbers aren't changing so essentially the solutions that you know will give us both are the ones that are going to be the real real important ones going forward and you know what are they um, you know for example if we think about uh, animals that are finished earlier so at the moment the average, I think, age at, uh, for, for dairy beef animals is something around 30 months. So if they were finished uh, two months earlier, three months earlier, whatever the number is, uh, that'll have a very, very strong effect on the footprint of the beef that's produced, but also on the absolute emissions. Those animals are not, they're not in around to produce emissions for those three months. Um, if we think about um, things like, you know, the additives that, that Katie and Ben both talked about, you know, okay, um, 
we haven't found a magic bullet yet. But there is some very exciting results coming out, you know, the Australian work on the seaweeds and that, you know, showing that there could be very strong potential in, in, in the future in some of these products. Yeah, they're, they're a bit off. Even, you know, even the Trinop product, even the, the Bovair product that's developed by DSM has shown huge potential. Yeah, it's in indoor systems uh, and we need something in a grazing system, but there is potential. Um, so, so I would be quite positive over time that there will some solutions come out on the ground. Again, how they're funded, how farmers pay for them, um, that's the next question. And that's something that, you know, if we have one that increases efficiency and also reduces emissions, absolute emissions, there we're in a real, real positive space. Thanks, Lawrence. Pat, we've lots of uh, questions coming in here. So given the time, I think we'll, we'll go straight into the questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, a question here in relation to the, if I combine it, yeah. Uh, in relation to the cooling effect, how exactly uh, does methane, ha methane have a cooling effect? And it's just uh, putting that, that in context, methane is an atmospheric and greenhouse gas. It is a greenhouse gas effect and therefore warms the atmosphere. Hey, hey, so, it's, sorry, and that's a very good question. I just spotted that myself. Um, so basically what we're saying there is that if there's more methane being removed or oxidized from the atmosphere than being produced, that means that there's less methane in the system. Um, and that's what we're talking about, whether you know, it's having um, and potentially a negative effect. So yes, 100% agree that methane is a global warming gas, but if there's less of it in the atmosphere and we, we, you know, we because of whatever, feed quality or whatever, uh, well then you know, there, that's how that effect is there. Um, but except okay. the point that it is a, a global warming gas and has a warming effect, but just the magnified reducing the amount of it in the atmosphere, obviously, is having that effect. Okay, a question in relation to agreed international methodology of, uh, of calculating the, the uh, emissions per, per liter of milk or per uh, kilogram of, of uh, protein fat adjusted milk. Where, where are we with, with kind of agreement on that? So th there's many different methodologies. You know, we have uh, International Dairy Federation, we have LEAP, we have the FAO, we have ISO. But in effect, most studies have little tweaks and differences that make it very hard to compare across studies. So unless the analysis is done using a similar model with a similar assumptions, like that uh, JRC report that was done in 2010, it's very hard to compare. And, you know, for example, you know, I, I referenced the New Zealand study. The New Zealand study took ref, you know, published data. It's published in the literature, so it was, it was, it was, it was fine. But it's when you start pulling those studies together and try to compare, then you have serious, uh, you know, differences in terms of how the methods are done. So it's not a fair comparison to compare the different studies. But but there is standards. Um, but in reality, if we want to compare countries, if we want to compare systems, we really need to use. Um, you know, a combined approach where everyone agrees specifically on the methods and the, the study has a, an objective of comparing. Okay, and I suppose a related question, uh, when, if ever, do you think the IPCC will, uh, will adopt uh, GWP star for, for measuring emissions? So, so again, it, there's a lot of work going on at the moment. There's, uh, there's IPCC are looking at it, the FAO are looking at it. There's a lot of of um, uh, working groups, and we're involved in the Chagas are involved, the department are involved in working groups looking at the, the metric as, as part of the overall numbers and um, looking at what is the, 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 the right approach. I suppose, you know, there is a lot of, you know, like, pardon the pun, hot air around it as well, because, you know, a lot of people get a bit emotional about it. But in reality, all we're looking for is the right approach uh, to calculate uh, emissions in 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 the most accurate fashion. All these in 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 effect are models and methodologies. They will all be wrong, but what we want is the approach that's the most close to what's reality. And I okay. think there's a lot of debate out there on it now. But it, it it's a good bit away, Pat. But there is a lot of work going on. Uh, I think a really good question for Ben. Ben, can you explain or, or suggest why there's such a, a, a drastic methane reduction effect of, of seaweed in the indoor uh, experiments and no significant impact uh, uh, outside? Um, could be due to a number of reasons. So the indoor experiments are using, the, I suppose, the most predominant one in the media is 
uh, red seaweed asparagopsis. So within our study, we used a very, very small proportion of that within the supplement. So the majority of the seaweeds were just red, red and, or sorry, green and brown seaweeds, um, which I think have previously shown to be not as effective at mitigate methane. And the effect of recent research has shown that red seaweed asparagopsis, its effect um, actually diminishes the longer it's in storage. So our, our supplement was wait, you know, would have been waiting a number of um, could, number of months before it was actually fed out to the cows. So it could have potentially lost its efficacy um, in that storage period. Um, and then you have to add into the effect as well that there, it, it was grazing, whereas that was indoors. When in that or, indoor study, they were continuously offered the supplement throughout the course of the day, whereas we were feeding them twice daily. So there's a number of different factors that could be a play there. So you, what you're saying is there, it could be a fact that it only has a, an effect for a very short time after the actual feeding and it's not included in the total. Diet. Yeah, and and its effect could, its actual potency could actually diminish over time as well. Yeah. You know, the longer it's in storage, you know, which okay. makes it difficult because if we do find one that, if it does just say, if we do feed red seaweed, you know, the, and we can't farm it in Ireland, the actual logistics of moon from one side of the world to the other, like it's going to be very, very difficult. So there's all that to think of as well, like. I think from uh, the presentation that uh, Sinead uh, Waters gave us uh, a few weeks ago, I think her, her thinking on that is that there would be synthetic uh, versions of the, the seaweed or that there would mm -hmm. be extracts uh, uh, that, that were those uh, uh, re reducing, methane reducing extracts that would be, could be created synthetically. So I think maybe that's, that's, that would address some of the questions there around the, the carbon footprint of harvesting and transporting uh, seaweed, yeah. which, which was being asked for. Um, ben, there was another question just while we were on you, you talking to you there. There was, um, was it in relation to the, uh, the effect of the long-term feeding additives? So did we go through that with you at grass, the actual effect of feeding additives long-term at grass? As in... So uh, well, yeah. So, yeah, I think actually went through that one. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Um, the, there's a question there about the uh, methane reducing additives currently. Um, are they EU uh, feed approved additives? So, so, so I might take that one. There's virtually there's very little, to be honest, uh, Mark, in terms of available uh, on the market today that are what I would call more importantly, our own national inventory approved. So we have none. That you know uh, that are we that we can feed that we can get credit for in our national inventory, and so so like there's a double approach here. There's you know, there's almost a triple approach. We need an additive that works. We need to be able to get it into the inv inventory, and then obviously it needs to be approved at a, an EU level as a as a feed additive. And you know there's a whole set of prongs to that uh, that that have to go through different stages to get use. Any plans to look at a methane vaccine similar to the research that's taking place in New Zealand? Not at the moment. Okay. Pat, anything else coming through for? Yeah, I suppose there's, there's a number of questions about the, the metrics, uh, whether we should be looking at uh, per hectare, per liter, or all of the above in, in, in our considerations. So, so, and we do, to be honest, um, but I suppose if we look at, you know, the, the, the two that count, um, you know, when we sell product in the market, it's the, the footprint on the per kilo milk solids or per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk is what's of interest. And if we look at it from a national point of view, it's the total emissions that are, that are, are important. And I suppose it's important to distinguish that there's a difference in methodology there. You know, the national emissions don't account the embedded emissions that come in from other countries. So for example, we bring in all our fertilizer, we don't include in the national inventory, we don't include the emissions associated with that. Whereas in our own uh, LCA that we would have presented and with an LCA approach, you include those emissions. So yeah, all of them are relevant. I, I suppose the, the footprint figure deals with the product. Um, I think what the question might be getting at by focusing on a per hectare, you're looking at the absolute emissions as a proxy. And, and that's something that we're, 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 we're looking at both, you know, and that's why I think it was important. That's why I distinguished between the footprint and the total emissions as being two different things. Okay, there's a, 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 a kind of a, a comment here uh, in relation to the uh, inclusion of 
the social justification in, in EBI uh, also as value starts to be put on, on carbon emissions, that it, it uh, uh, will be a, an economic justification as well. I think that's probably a comment rather than a, a, a question. Um, just in terms of, of, of uh, research in relation to the long-term impact uh, on, uh, of uh, additives, and what is the, the research there? Is it something that tail that is tending to tail off and, and cows as cows get used to it? Or are there is there research indicating that some of these additives have a, a sustained impact? Trinop, um, I suppose this is the most successful one internationally. So or it's called commercially called Bover. So that's been widely researched and um, you know it's been consistently shown across a lot of studies to um, um, reduce methane over a long-term period. So that's the, definitely the most promising one. Um, but the thing about Trinop is that it needs to be in the rumen continuously. So it's very, very much suited to a TMR diet. There is research going on um, in New Zealand looking at developing slow release formulations. Um, so, you know, it does need to be tailored for pasture-based diets, but if it could be tailored, you know, it'd be massive like, but you know, it's, it's it just, you know, we need to find out what the results will be from that research. It's important to say also to the asparagus studies, the seaweed, the red seaweed studies, the Australian studies have shown over longer periods, like, you know, 130, 140, 150 day periods that the effect is still there. So, so, you know, there are, there are additives that are working over long periods, but it's a good question because initial work on additives had shown a, a, a decline on the efficacy over time. The room and state, the room and account are changed to take home, but um, some of the newer products are working. We have a question here in relation to the cost of these additives and uh, a commentary, I suppose, more than a question, but instead of putting a cost on farmers by adding feed additives to the diet, would it not be easier to adjust the sward and uh, in the context of uh, multi-species uh, swords and reducing uh, methane? I think quoting some research from, from Reading uh, University here as well. Um, like over the last number of weeks, we've heard a lot from our colleagues, uh, John Finn and, and uh, colleagues in UCD about the role of multi-species grassland. And I suppose in general, the, 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 this more, we we'll call them nature-based type solutions to addressing these problems. Um, maybe there is a concern that we're, 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 we're tending towards um, a, a route of engineering rather than looking at the, the, the more nature-based uh, solutions. How would you respond to that, uh, Lawrence? Um, you know, when you're in a corner and you're looking for solutions, you'll take any solution that comes, Mark. So absolutely, uh, we're, our plans are also to look at mixed species and its impact. There is some interesting work from the New Zealanders, and we were actually only talking to them yesterday on it in terms of the impact uh, that potentially is there from a methane perspective. Um, so, so absolutely, we will take all the solutions that can, can be got, and we will look at all the solutions. We just a quick comment from somebody there. They're, they're accusing us of not uh, following through on the vaccine question. Um, you were saying that there's no current plans. Uh, maybe could you elaborate on that, uh, Lawrence, just to, for completeness? Yeah, so we, are, we have, to, to be clear, crystal clear on it, we've done nothing on it in, from a vaccine point of view. There's huge work going on in New Zealand over the last 20 years. Now, this is just to be crystal clear, it's the methane vaccine. Um, um, <laughs> but yeah, we've done... We've done um, nothing on it from an Irish, except for looking at the literature and look at what's coming out. Um, and it's something that we're watching the New Zealands and we, we New Zealanders on, and we, we, we talk to them regularly. And it's nothing that's on our radar at the moment. Does that, does that answer it? Yes, I know. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's just a... There's a question there in relation to breed, uh, breeding and you mentioned the impact of, of breeds uh, and whether or not uh, individual breeds are showing a better footprint. Are, and in relation potentially in relation to crossbred animals as well. So just to maybe put a, a little bit of, of detail around that for people. Um, there's not very much research conducted on it. We, we are doing research this year, um, profiling the greenhouse gas methane emissions of the next generation herd um, in terms of their enteric fermentation, or actual methane um, emissions measured. So we have high and low EBI cows and we have the Jersey herd as well. Um, so we've only begun the measurements but it'll be, you know, it'll be a few, a few months before we get enough data to look into it in, in more detail. Um, You're yeah. looking for another invite back in a, in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that when we modeled it in the past, that we've looked at it from a number of different studies, you know, the crossbreds come out very well from a footprint point of view. 
So, so, so previous research has shown them in a very positive light. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. We're over time. I don't know where that hour went. Uh, ben, Lawrence and Katie, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, a reminder to everybody that the, the presentation and recording of today will be available uh, on our website. And also we'll have a recording uh, available on the new Signpost series uh, podcast, which is available on all of the various uh, podcast platforms. Uh, before we leave you today, I just want to bring to your attention a series of dialogues that the Department of Agriculture is organizing over the next number of weeks, starting next Wednesday, the 21st of April. And it fits in with the overall United Nations Food Systems uh, Summit, which is taking place uh, throughout this year. And um, so there's some really high profile speakers uh, speaking during the series, dealing with uh, sustainable food systems and uh, foreign policy around a sustainable food system. So there's a huge array of, of, of talks available there. Uh, so I, I understand places are limited. So if you're interested in attending, you can go onto the Department of Agriculture website and register your, your uh, place there. Uh, so really worth uh, looking at that if uh, you want to find out more about uh, what's happening at, at a, a, I suppose, a global level around food uh, systems, security and sustainability. Uh, Pass, thanks very much for helping with questions today. And thanks to our production team, Andy Boland and Yvonne Marr, who are uh, the stalwarts in, in this series. Um, and thank you for tuning in today. Um, next week, uh, thanks again, Lawrence, Katie and Ben. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.